Okay, bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. So inshallah continuing with our study of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Asiratul Nabawiyah, the prophetic biography. In the previous session we talked about after the Prophet ﷺ's return back from the campaign and the expedition of Tabuk, we talked about how the people of Ta'if, Banu Thaqif, they arrived in Medina and they accepted Islam at that time. And it was a very, um, a very powerful and also a very heart, you know, felt, very heartwarming uh, story and experience from the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And there were also some very profound lessons uh, that were contained there where we talked about the idea of community and how community is compassion and the type of approach, the type of mentality, the type of um, you know heart uh, that community requires and that community is built upon. One of the things that I had mentioned last time and I had kind of mentioned it very briefly, I wanted to go back and touch base on it just once more um, because what we're going to be talking about is unfortunately a very different side of community as well. So I want to start off by reminding us of exactly what the foundation of the community of the Prophet ﷺ was. How he built and how he established that beautiful community of Medina that is a role model for all of our communities today. One of our very senior teachers who's passed away now, Sheikh Abdul Wahid Rahimullah, he always used to talk about this idea that the goal of the work that we're doing is to try to get back to the place where Medina was before the passing of the Prophet ﷺ. So that's where we're trying to always get back to, that type of you know, sincerity and that type of love and that type of inclusivity and compassion. That's what we're trying to work our way back towards. So the story that I had mentioned was that the Prophet and I and I didn't get to explain the proper context of this, the Prophet because of his routine and his schedule and how demanding his lifestyle was, Right, the Prophet would he he wanted you know, and and it's a part of something that we all need to think about spiritually. He would spend time every day dedicated to just his relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and he used to do this every single day. And so, one of the moments that the Prophet, one of the times of the day, the Prophet would dedicate really to purely just his relationship with Allah was before Fajr. In the nighttime, وَصَلُّوا بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّاسُ نِيَامِ Because the idea is a lot of times spirituality can come at the expense of other obligations and responsibilities that we have. And a lot of times that just ends up becoming selfishness and self-indulgence. But spirituality is not that I neglect my, my family. Spirituality is not that I ignore the community. Spirituality is not that I tone out, you know, the problems in society. That is not spirituality. So the Prophet ﷺ used to dedicate a couple of hours of just dedicated worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the very minimum. But when did he do it? He used to do it at 3 a.m. You know, he would sacrifice his own personal rest in order to invest into his relationship with Allah, but not make his family sacrifice, or not make the community sacrifice, or not, make, not ignore what's going on around him in the world around him, but he would do it at night. And so in order, and then the rest of the day used to be so busy, he'd come for Fajr, after Fajr he'd answer questions, spend time with people, check on people, then he'd go around Medina, see if there was anything that needed addressing, he would go home for a little bit, he would take a little bit of a nap, uh, you know, siesta, qaylula, and then basically Dhuhr Time would come after the Dhuhr time, he would go and he would sometimes check on some, you know, relatives and other people who needed visitations, visit them in their homes. He would visit people in their homes. And then Asr time, after Asr time, he used to go home. And then from Asr to Maghrib, he used to spend time with his family. Like talking to his wife and you know playing with the kids and checking on the grandkids and you know and then Maghrib time from Maghrib to Isha he would be in the masjid uh, again just teaching people talking to people spending time with people then Isha prayer would come so and then remember his day didn't start at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. or whenever Fajr was his day started at 3 a.m. because of his worship routine so in order to be able to just manage all of that and kind of not lose his sanity and not lose you know his mind because of how busy he would be, the Prophet ﷺ was very particular about that when the Isha prayer is done, he would go home. 
And he would pray whatever needed to be prayed as a follow-up to Isha at home. And then he would go to bed. And in fact, the Prophet ﷺ, and this is something we see in society, the parents who maybe have you know, teenagers or who have raised teenagers are gonna nod their heads when they're going to understand this, that you know, with the later you stay up at night, the more you sleep in and during the day. Right, and there we go, there's the head nods, right? So they're like, yes, correct, right? So that's, that's a common frustration that we all have, right? The, the, the bad habits that start to develop during that time. So for this reason, the Prophet ﷺ, Naha anis samar. The Prophet ﷺ very seriously disapproved of staying up late in the night and you know, just hanging around and that's when the qahwa or the tea or the coffee and hopefully nothing else worse than that starts coming out and everyone just sits around and congregates and laughs and jokes and talks and before you know it, it's 1 a.m., 2 a.m. and that just completely destroys productivity. Right, even from a very worldly, dunyawi perspective, whenever they talk to you know people who are very, um, very brilliant, you know, brilliant people, people who are leaders of their industry and things like that, they always talk about the fact about how they go to bed early at night and they wake up at the crack of dawn. They wake up very early in the morning. So that's an important part of productivity. So the Prophet ﷺ was not about you know social gatherings at nighttime. But like I mentioned last time, community requires you to really sacrifice even part of yourself, right? So the Prophet ﷺ was aware that these people of Ta'if are here. They're kind of, sort of, almost becoming, about to become Muslim. So maybe they already had some of these bad habits of hanging out at night. And then on top of that, they're travelers. And I talked about last time how travelers, you know, they usually, everyone's camping out, so everyone's staying up and hanging out. The Prophet ﷺ would go home after Isha, but then would think about it that these guests are here, and he would come back out at night and talk to them. And there was something very, almost like very endearing in the behavior of the Prophet ﷺ that the Sahaba, they describe, um, uh, Aus bin Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was amongst this delegation from Ta'if, who became Muslim later on, he describes this, he says the Prophet ﷺ would come and he would come out to check on us, because we'd all be hanging out in the masjid and talking, so he'd come out to hang out with us and check on us. And then he says that, But he wouldn't sit down. You know when you're kind of in a rush, in a hurry, but you do want to talk to somebody, you don't sit down. And when they say, sit down, sit down, you're like, no, no, I have to go, I have to go. Just real quick, just a minute, just a minute, right? And so the Prophet ﷺ would stand there, talk, and he said that he would give so much of himself to us. Like he'd, he'd, he'd be so sincere and he'd like really get into the conversation and start telling us about his life and start asking us about our lives. That the conversation would go on so long, he'd get tired. And then he would start to lean on one leg and lean over to the other leg. And you know, like when you're standing outside talking in the parking lot, you're like, I gotta go, I gotta go, I gotta go. And then you're talking and then after a while you notice yourself, you're leaning on the car, right? And things like that. So that's how the Prophet was. That's how much he loved people. And specifically, he would talk about, you know, and this is the other thing. We think community is always just based off of lectures and halaqahs and classes, as I'm giving a halaqah, right? But I get the irony in that. However, we think that that's completely what communi community is predicated upon. Community is about sharing your lives and sharing personal experiences and really bonding with one another on common experiences. And so what did the Prophet ﷺ used to talk to them about? He didn't want to start giving them a lecture, Alhamdulillah, he didn't start giving them a lecture. What did he say? لَا أَنْسَى وَكُنَّا مُسَّضَعْفِينَ مُسْتَذَلِّينَ بِمَكَّةَ فَلَمَّا خَرَجْنَا إِلَى الْمَدِينَةَ كَانَتْ سِجَالُ الْحَرْبِ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَهُمْ نُدَالُ عَلَيْهِ Oh, I remember the days when we were weak and oppressed in Mecca. And then we came to Medina and then there were wars and some of them we won, some of them they won. And it went back and forth. And he would just kind of talk about life and experiences, struggles and sacrifices. Because that's something that we all share. Everyone's got some pain. Everyone's got some struggle. Everyone's got some type of sacrifice. So this was what the community of the Prophet was built upon. But that specific thing I mentioned was one particular night when he didn't come out for a long time and they kind of you know jokingly said to the Prophet ﷺ, that you know they the they said that you know we've been expecting you because you come out every night so we've been expecting you but you came out a little bit later and the Prophet ﷺ said that I was reading my portion of the Quran that I read every night and it just took a little longer today 
and the the the, the narrator uh, Imam Abu Dawood in that narration he adds on to the end of it that O specifically mentions that I asked the companions of the Prophet وسلم, how much Quran they used to like how they would divide up the Quran like how many days they would finish up Quran in a reading of the Quran some said thalathun some said three days some said khamsun five days some said sab'un seven days some said tis'un nine days some said ihda ashrata eleven days some said thalathata ashara um, thirteen days but nevertheless, you see that these were people who spent a lot of time with the Qur'an every day. Because that's the food for the soul, right? And that's something we definitely need to recommit ourselves to. So, I started here by kind of reiterating where we ended last time. To remind us of what the community of the Prophet ﷺ was built on. Because as I said, we have a little bit more of a challenging theme to talk about today. Another part of community is that sometimes there are difficulties and there are conflicts and there are problems in a community. And what we're going to be talking about today is kind of the final chapter of one of the really problematic people in the community of the Prophet ﷺ. That was a man by the name of Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Sulul. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Sulul was a man who is very, you know, infamously remembered as Ra'isul Munafiqi. He was a leader of the band of hypocrites, the group of hypocrites. Okay, and what hypocrisy means here is not necessarily, you know, the Prophet ﷺ in a hadith, in multiple hadith, he talks about, you know, ayatul munafiqi thalathun, three signs of hypocrisy. When you speak, you lie. When you make a promise, you break it. When you are trusted with something, you violate that trust. In another narration, he adds a fourth one, that whenever you get into a dispute or an argument with someone, you become obscene or vile. Okay, like you can't disagree without fighting. All right, so the, those are more like what the scholars have explained, nifaq amali. Those are the actions of the hypocrites. But what the hypocrites were during the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ that the Quran spoke about, that the Prophet ﷺ dealt with, they were true hypocrites, hypocrites of the heart. And that's something we, that we can never, you know, ever know. It's something we constantly, you know, gauge ourselves in regards to. We hold ourselves accountable for. We take a long, hard look in the mirror periodically. But it's not something that can objectively be gauged from the outside. That can't be measured or seen from the outside. It's something inside the heart and only Allah knows. We are fearful of it. We are mindful of it. We work actively against it for ourselves. But we can't say that about anyone ever. All right? But the hypocrites at the time of the Prophet ﷺ were declared and exposed by God, and they were exposed by the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. And so these were very, very seriously you know, problematic people. They were people who acted and pretended like they were Muslims. They acted as if they were part of you know, the efforts and the str struggles of the Muslims of that time. But they were constantly, actively working behind the back of the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims in trying to undermine them and trying to betray them and in trying to aid the enemy against them. And there's multiple incidents that we've talked about in this series, uh, which, you know, where they unfortunately did something really terrible. Like in the, when the Prophet ﷺ arrived in Medina, they tried to create conflict uh, between the Muhajirun and the Ansar, and they insulted the Prophet ﷺ. When they left for the Battle of Uhud, when they were going to fight the army that was coming and defend Medina against the army at Uhud, they came out initially to kind of give them a sense of confidence, and then they, at the last minute, they pulled out to try to, you know, because imagine like if, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to purchase something and I talk to the brother and I say, you know, I can't afford it on my own. Could you partner with me on this, on this deal? And he says, yes, I'll go 50-50 with you. So I proceed confidently into the contract. Then imagine as I'm sitting down about to sign the contract, he goes, oh yeah, I'm out. He left me high and dry. That puts me in a very bad, tight spot, and that's just money. Over here, it was potentially the loss of life. And eventually, it was the loss of life. At Uhud, 70 Sahaba were martyred, were shuhada. So, they did terrible things like this on numerous occasions. We talked about Surah Al-Munafiqun coming down and the incident behind that. So, this man, Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul, and if we talked about this, I'll briefly recap it here. In the last major incident that you know, he was a part of, they were out on the journey of Banu Mustaliq. 
he at night gathered together with a group of his cronies and his buddies, and he said some very vile things about the Prophet ﷺ. Called him, you know, uh, he, he referred to him as uh, lowly and filthy and humiliated and so, far, so on and so forth. Um, one of the young, sincere Muslims heard this conversation, came to the Prophet ﷺ, and informed him. The Prophet ﷺ, when he asked them, he summoned them and he asked them about this, they lied and they swore, يَحْلِفُونَ بِاللَّهِ مَا قَالُوا Right? يَحْلِفُونَ لَكُمْ لِتَرْضَوْا عَنْهُمْ Like many references in the Qur'an. Right? So they said, قَالُوا نَشْهَدُ إِنَّكَ لَرَسُولُ اللَّهِ Right? No, 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 we know you're the messenger of Allah. We bear witness and we didn't do this and we didn't do that and we didn't say this. And eventually Allah revealed Surah Al-Munafiqun where He exposed them. Wallahu yashhadu inna al-munafiqeen al-kathibun. God testifies that these people are a bunch of liars. So Allah exposed them. When that happened, that's it. That was kind of the final, you know, that was the, that was the final, uh, that was the final, you know, indiscretion. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. So when they returned back to Medina, his own son opposed him and threatened him. And eventually, his own tribe's people, his own family members who were sincere Muslims, basically placed him under house arrest. They told him, you're not allowed to speak publicly anymore because you used to sometimes get up and start speaking in the masjid without permission from the Prophet ﷺ. They said, no, you're not allowed to do that anymore. And they kind of essentially placed him under house arrest and they banned him from participating in any type of communal activities. Um, and when he was caught lying about having said terrible things about the Prophet ﷺ, you might remember Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, now that God has exposed him, should we not deal with him? Which was code for, we should remove him from existence, right? So at that time, the Prophet ﷺ said no, because then people, people won't know the backstory, and they won't care about the backstory, right? We know the nature of gossip. What they'll say is, in the Muhammad and yaqtul ashabahu, that Muhammad kills his own people. So no. And then when his own people placed him under house arrest and silenced him, the Prophet ﷺ turned to Umar, and he said, do you see what I was talking about? Allah will make a way. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, I already knew this, but at that moment it was a reminder of that the most, the greatest strategy in the world could never outdo the wisdom of the Prophet So much wisdom. Alright? Let this play itself out. There's a wisdom in that. Let it play itself out. You know, it's a sinking ship. It's a downward spiral. It's a stone rolling down a hill. You don't need to try to push it. You just get out of the way and it'll keep on rolling itself down the hill and crash. Okay? So that's what ended up happening with him. We are now at the occasion when the Prophet ﷺ came back from the journey of Tabuk. Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul, this man who had been so much trouble, he became ill. This narration, these are narrations that are mentioned by Ibn Ishaq and Al-Waqidi, and even narrations that are found in Bukhari and Muslim. He became very, very ill. And something very interesting, this, this, this should blow our minds, this should just absolutely astound us. He became ill, and the narration mentions, وَكَانَ مَرَضُهُ عِشْرِينَ لَيْلَةً He was very, very sick for 20 days. فَكَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ يَعُودُهُ فِيهَا كَانَ يَعُودُهُ فِيهَا He didn't say the Prophet visited him. He regularly visited him. Who does that? Who does that? Your enemy, your sworn enemy. And you know when we use that word in today's culture, it's hyperbole, right? It's drama, right? It's blown out of proportion. No, no, no. This was an actual enemy. He tried to assassinate, murder the Prophet on multiple occasions. He was the pri primary architect of the slander against the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, the mother of the believers, Aisha. He was involved in causing so much pain to the Prophet ﷺ, his family and his community and his Sahaba. And he becomes sick, he is ill, and the Prophet ﷺ visits him multiple times, goes to check on him and see how he's doing. It's beyond even, and this is the meaning of إِنَّكَ لَا عَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ 
One of our teachers, Asim Shaykh Puri Rahmallah, who is our teacher in Tafsir, he said, Innaka la ala, Allah used the word ala, lil isti'ala, means to be on top of something, because Allah is saying, you are above good character. <clears throat> like think about the best character you've ever seen in your entire life, that's where the character of the Prophet ﷺ, where it ends, that's where his character started. He was beyond what we even call good character. Nobility, he was beyond nobility. Unbelievable. And so the Prophet ﷺ went to go visit him. So he actually made a request of the Prophet ﷺ. Think about how accessible and how kind and how generous your soul must be that your sworn enemy actually can feel like they can make a request of you. He said, فَإِن مُتُّ He said, if I die, فَحْضُرْ غُسْلِي That I would like for you to be present at the washing of my body. وَأَعْطِنِي قَمِيسَكَ الَّذِي يَلِي جَسَدَكَ فَكَفِّنِي فِيهِ And please grant me your shirt that is touching your body so that I may be shrouded in that. وَصَلِّي عَلَيَّ And I want you to pray my janazah prayer. وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِي And I want you to pray for my forgiveness. He made these requests of the Prophet ﷺ. So the narration goes on to mention that when he finally died, his son, whose name was also Abdullah, he was a sincere Muslim. Remember, he was the one who confronted his father and said, I will not allow you to enter Medina until you take back the terrible things you said about the Prophet ﷺ. And so his son came to the Prophet ﷺ and you know, he was very torn up. He said, I know my father did terrible things, but he was my dad. And he's dead now, he passed away. And I, and I fear for him. So he asked for your shirt. So can you please give me your shirt so that we can shroud him and bury him in your, in your garments. The Prophet ﷺ took off his shirt and he gave it to him. He took off his shirt and he gave it to him. Imam Bukhari ta'ala does mention that when the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, Abbas, he, was, he became Muslim a little bit after this, and he kept his Islam hid, secret, hidden for some time because of the danger in Mecca. He came to fight against the Muslims in the Battle of Badr. But he did not come willingly, he was forced. They made him come to try to make a point against the Prophet and rally support against the Prophet So he very reluctantly came with the Quraysh in the Battle of Badr and he was captured in the Battle of Badr. When he was captured, his shirt had become torn. And so while he was being held captive, the Prophet ﷺ came by and he saw that he was tied up and his shirt were torn. And this is the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ called the Sahaba together and he said, he's my uncle. And he's an old gentleman. If it's okay with y'all, do y'all mind untying his hands? And he said, of course, my master, you just have to tell us what to do. He said, I know, but I have to be fair and just. It can't just be because it's my uncle. You have to agree to that. And so they untied him and then his shirt was torn. So Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul, who had a relationship with Abbas as businessmen from back in the day, he saw that his shirt was torn, so he brought him an extra shirt and gave it to him. And so Imam Bukhari mentions that that was also part of the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ, that he paid this favor back. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, anyone who displayed any kindness or generosity towards me, I was able to pay all of them back except for Abu Bakr. For Allah, because Abu Bakr has done so much, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have to reward him on my behalf. So that was also part of the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ giving a shirt for Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul to be buried in. Then there's a little bit of a you know, disagreement amongst the muhaddithun. Um, the narration of Bukhari mentions that the Prophet ﷺ did not pray the janazah of Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul. He did not lead the janazah prayers. The narration of Sahih Muslim and some others mentions that he did offer the janazah prayer. It's just a little difference of opinion. But essentially what it says is that the son then said, his janazah is ready, can you please come and lead the prayer? The Prophet ﷺ got up and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, you know, kind of reached out and grabbed the clothes of the Prophet ﷺ. He said, I'm pleading with him, he's begging him, O Messenger of Allah, إِنَّهُ قَالَ فِي يَوْمِ كَذَا كَذَا وَكَذَا وَقَالَ فِي يَوْمِ كَذَا كَذَا وَكَذَا He said this and he said that and he said this and he said that. You can't go and pray his janazah. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, دَعْنِي يَا عُمَرُ He said, leave me, O Umar. فَإِنِّي بَيْنَ خَيْرَتَيْنِ For I have been given two options. 
I have been given two options. In the Rabbi Khayyarani, my Lord has given me options. What he was referring to was the ayah in Surah At-Tawbah. Ayah number 80, verse number 80 in Surah At-Tawbah. In which Allah says, استغفر لهم أو لا تستغفر لهم. Seek forgiveness for them, these hypocrites, or do not seek forgiveness for them. إِن تستغفر لهم سبعين مرة فلن يغفر الله لهم. Even if you were to seek forgiveness for them 70 times, Allah would never forgive them. Because they disbelieved in God and His Messenger. So the Prophet ﷺ, he actually commented at that time, Imam Bukhari mentions the narration, that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, وَلَوْ أَعْلَمُوا أَنِّي إِنْ زِدْتُ عَلَى سَبْعِينَ غُفِرَتْ لَهُ لَزِدْتُ He said that if I knew, God said even if you ask forgiveness for them 70 times, Allah will still not forgive them. If I knew that by asking forgiveness for them 71 times, Allah would forgive them, I would then pray for His forgiveness 71 times. Look how generous the soul of the Prophet is. Look how invested he is. Harisun alaykum. Look how invested he is into people's salvation. By any means, whatever it takes. Right? That's that type of compassion that we were talking about. So now, the way that some of the scholars like Ibn Kathir and others have reconciled that did he lead the Janazah or not, is that the narrations that say he then went, the narration assumes that he led the Janazah, he went, but on his way there, right when he was about to reach there, the next ayah basically came down where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet ﷺ, Do not offer, do not lead their janazah prayers, nor should you go and stand at their grave and pray for them there. So that verse came down and so the Prophet ﷺ, the narration that says he led the prayer, assumes he led the prayer because he left there. But before he arrived there, the verse came down and he turned back from there. And that's why the narration says he's ultimately, he left to lead the prayer, but he ultimately did not end up leading the prayer. And that is the proper understanding. Allah Ta'ala Alam, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala knows best. So, thank you. So, at this particular time, of course, then Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul was buried at this time and that was essentially the end of his, his very tragic story uh, of a man who very tragically and unfortunately made it the purpose of his life to oppose the Prophet And just for the sake of reflection and for the sake of lesson, if we were to kind of think about it and reflect upon it, what exactly led to that circumstance in that situation, um, it becomes very apparent from the very beginning that ultimately the issue was ego. And it was arrogance. Because Sa'ad bin Ubadah radiallahu ta'ala anhu actually told the Prophet or I believe it was Sa'ad bin Zurara, he told the Prophet that basically the two tribes that were in the Ansar, the Arabs of Medina, Aus and Khazraj, they had been warring and fighting and quarreling for quite some time. And they had ultimately started to reach some type of peace amongst one another. And the terms of that peace were that they were going to appoint Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulut to kind of be the de facto leader, the governor of both tribes. And that would, that's how they were going to reconcile. And that coincided with the time where they became introduced to Islam. And once they became introduced to Islam, then of course they turned their attention to the Prophet ﷺ. And he always resented that fact. That I was going to be chief, and he came and he took that away from me. And it was just that arrogance, and it was that ego, in spite of all the generosity. When the Prophet ﷺ arrived in Medina, he arrived in Medina. Hundreds of Muslims from Medina, from Quba, came to welcome the Prophet ﷺ. There was like a whole parade, like a congregation following him into the city of Medina. And Asad bin Zurara requested the Prophet ﷺ, do you mind stopping by and just kind of like, you know, greeting him? You know, recognizing him, acknowledging him as a leader? And the Prophet ﷺ stopped the whole procession, hundreds of people, detoured, went to the house of Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sulul, knocked on his door, and said, I'm here, I've arrived in the city, and I would like to, you know, get off on the right foot and build a relationship with you. We work together to bring the people together. And he refused to come out of his house. He said, I don't want to talk to him. If I want to find him, I'll find him. So it was that arrogance, and that ultimately did him in.
And that's something we have to constantly think about. The next thing that I wanted to talk about here today is there are um, two more um, deaths that occurred in the ninth year of Hijrah. Towards the end of the ninth year of Hijrah, there were two more deaths that occurred. One happened in the month of Rajab, and the other happened in the month of Sha'ban. And they were both, these were deaths of two very remarkable people. And they were very sad occasions for the Prophet ﷺ. In the month of Rajab is when An-Najashi, An-Najashi, the king of Abyssinia, the Muslim king of Abyssinia, his name was, Najashi was more of the title of the position. Okay? It's like president or king. It was just the title. His name was actually Ashama. He has a very fascinating story. We had a whole session dedicated to him very early on in the series uh, where we talked about him. But he had a very fascinating uh, situation where his father was king and his, father's, his father was m killed, murdered, and most of his family was also massacred by his uncle. All right? Lion King. But anyways, so his father was killed and most of the family... <laughs> Forgive me, right? So most of his family was also massacred by his uncle. Um, he, the child, Ashama, was, on, was the only survivor. And he was actually, by some of his father's supporters and loyalists, he was hidden and taken away and raised out in the countryside. And he had even lived abroad in different regions for some time. And because of that, you know, he grew up like on a farm. He was a very humble man because of that. He grew up working on a farm, learning how to work with his hands. A simple person. He, grew up, he didn't grow up as a spoiled prince. And not only that, but the people that he grew up around were very devout Christians. So he actually studied the Christian tradition and was a Christian scholar, a biblical scholar in his own right. And later on, once he had grown up, then they kind of rallied together the loyalists of his father. And then they brought him basically back and he led a coup and was able to regain the throne that belonged to his father. And the other thing was also the fact that his uncle was a very, he was a tyrant. And so it was very easy for him to drum up support. And he was a very benevolent ruler. Very humble, very generous, very benevolent. And, you know, uh, safety, security... Um, and particularly, you know, uh, rights and freedoms and asylum and religious freedom was something that were some of his, the hallmarks of his kingdom. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ sent the early Meccan Muslims to Abyssinia to take refuge there. Because he knew about this king. This king had a reputation. If you have trouble in your own homeland, that's the place you can go and seek asylum. And you'll be safe. And he'll even support you. Okay, he'll provide relief and refuge. So he was an amazing person. We know the story. Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala anhu recites the Quran to him. He becomes Muslim. He tries to sway the court to, you know, his ministers and everyone to accept Islam with him. He finds him to be completely unreceptive to this. He's very fearful of the fact that this will cause a lot of upheaval. This will endanger the lives of these Muslims, nearly a hundred people, and it will create chaos in the kingdom. So it's civil war, loss of life. And so he decided strategically, very wisely, and the Prophet approved of this decision, to keep his Islam private. But he was a very devout Muslim. Him and Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the cousin of the Prophet ﷺ, had a very close relationship. Ja'far used to come and visit him regularly. And they would pray together. And Ja'far used to teach him the Qur'an. And it's beautiful, beautiful stories. It talks about that one moment where uh, after the Battle of Badr happened and the Muslims had a victory, miraculous victory, Ja'far came to give him the news, but Najashi already heard about it. And so when he walked in, he found Najashi wearing some old clothes and sitting on the ground. Kind of like making dhikr. And he said, what are you doing? And he said, I don't know what Muslims are supposed to do. But in the Christian tradition, one way that we show gratitude is, we put on an old pair of clothes, we sit on the ground and we praise the Lord when something good happens. So I heard about the victory at Badr, so I was just trying to thank Allah for the victory at Badr, however I know how. He in fact, create, he in fact arranged the escort for Ramla bint Abi Sufyan, Ummu Habiba, who would become a wife of the Prophet ﷺ, safely to Medina, and in fact offered the mahar, the marriage gift on behalf of the Prophet ﷺ to her. So he had a very beautiful relationship in this way. His personal assistant, his khadim, right? He, um, he had also become Muslim. So when Najashi, and I talked about this before, but when Najashi was about to die, when he was about to pass away, he told his personal assistant, who was also a Muslim secretly, he said, look, it's a Christian kingdom. 
I'm the king, they're going to have a huge Christian funeral and procession and awake and all that good stuff. They're going to do all that stuff. But I want to first have a Muslim funeral. So when I die, put a sh wash my body, put a shroud on me, and I want you to pray my janazah. And that's what his assistant did. And then basically he called everyone in and then they had the Christian funeral. One other thing the, it mentions is that, and again, this is not something that's allowed in Islam. We're not supposed to do this, but he didn't know. He didn't know any better because he was so far away. Um, he had some pages that had the Qur'an written on it. It's said to be the same verses that Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala had recited to him from Surah Maryam. He had written it down on a couple of papers. And he always used to keep those pages folded and used to put them inside of his shirt. Right? And that's why even when he would talk to his ministers, he would always say, this is what I believe, this is what I believe. And they would think that he was saying like, you know, like I believe in you know, our kingdom or whatever. But he was actually always tapping the pages of the Qur'an he had inside of his shirt. So when he died, he, when he was gonna die, he told his assistant, I want you to take those pages of the Qur'an and I want you to put them inside of my shroud. So when they do their whole Christian funeral, I still die as a Muslim and I die with the kalam of Allah. And then bury me with that. We're not supposed to bury pages of the Qur'an with the deceased. But again, that was excusable because he didn't know that's not the right thing to do. Nevertheless, when he passed away, the Prophet ﷺ commented. And he said, today a great man has passed away. A great believer has passed away. And when the people from Habasha came to visit the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ got up, he took off his shawl, he put his shawl on the ground and he made them sit on it. And they felt very like, you know, kind of... You know, awkward about that, and he made them sit. And then he went to go get them water and dates, and the Sahaba said, we'll get it for you, we'll get it for you. And he said, no, 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 I will get it. When my people went to their king, he personally took care of them. So I will personally take care of them. And when he passed away, the Prophet ﷺ said, a great believer has passed today. And then the Prophet ﷺ offered a janazah prayer for him in Medina. It was the only time in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ when he offered janazah for someone who did not die there and whose body was not there in Medina. It's called janazah bil ghaib, janazah, funeral in absentia. It was the only time the Prophet ﷺ did that. And he did that for al Jashi. And then the Prophet ﷺ commented as well, said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed me al Jashi in paradise wearing two beautiful garments and smiling. And he is in paradise. So Najashi passed away here in the ninth year of uh, Hijrah in this year. And then the second death that um, occurred here towards the end of the year, it happened in the month of Sha'ban. And this was very tragic. It was the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ. Ummu Kulthum. And this was the second daughter of the Prophet ﷺ to pass away. He, um, his first daughter who died was by the name of Ruqayya. She died in the second year of uh, Hijrah when they were returning back from Badr. They got back from Badr and they found out that she had passed away. And this was his second daughter. And he had three sons who also, uh, well, two who had passed before this. So this was the fourth child the Prophet ﷺ had lost. Right? And um, this daughter of the Prophet ﷺ was of course very beloved to him. And she passed away in this particular year. And um, some of the f relatives, Asma bint Umais, who was the wife of Ja'far. Um, Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib, who was the aunt of the Prophet ﷺ. They washed her body and prepared the janazah. And then the Prophet ﷺ personally uh, buried her. Um, and. The narration mentions that the Prophet ﷺ was very upset at the burial. And the narration even mentions that he ended up kind of reprimanding someone at the burial. And he was just very upset. He lost another one of his children, his daughter. And it had a profound impact and effect on him. It was very painful for him. Um, so this also happened here in the ninth year. Um, lastly and finally, the, the final, um, you know, the, the other big event that occurred in the ninth year of Hijrah was the very first Hajj in the history of Islam. So Hajj was initiated by Ibrahim alayhi salam, وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ The Qur'an mentions um, that make the call for Hajj. Hajj had continued on, but unfortunately as we've talked about, you know, the, the place 
and the occasion was the same, but it had become completely distorted. And it had in fact become a celebration of, you know, they would do business and poetry and tribe and, you know, even celebration of shirk, unfortunately. But this year, the ninth year of Hijrah was the first year that Hajj was restored to its original purpose. And this was the first Hajj, this is called Hajjatul Islam. This is the restoration of the Hajj by Islam. Okay, in accordance with Islam. The Prophet ﷺ did not go on this Hajj. He sent Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu as the leader and Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu as the like teacher on this Hajj. Uh, and 200 companions, he sent them to go and perform the Hajj and kind of, you know, set the groundwork for the Hajjatul Wida. The farewell Hajj, Hajjatun Nabi, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Hajj of the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which would happen next year. So, inshallah, in the next session, we'll talk about the Hajj uh, that Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu went and performed, and exactly what happened there, and what efforts were made by Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, how the foundation and the groundwork was laid for the following year when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would go and perform the Hajj. And we'll um, pause here, and we'll talk about that in the next session. Yeah. No, they were not. So we'll, we'll talk about that in the next session where a verse from Surah At-Tawbah specifically came down prohibiting the participation of the mushrikun in the Hajj with the Muslims. They were not running around together. No, no. And because this was also after the conquest of Mecca, so Mecca, the, the Kaaba itself, the Safa Marwa, Mina, Muzalifa, Arafa, all of these sacred places had been purged from idols and from the practice of shirk. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything we've said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Nashad wa la ilaha illa anta. Nasakfirka wa natabu ilayk. So, I believe... Um